This Week on Waterways, the Florida Keys Carrying Capacity Study, and Species Spotlight, the Roseate Spoonbill. In the year 2000, there were over 79,000 people living in the Florida Keys, an increase of almost 20,000 in just 20 years. In the year 2000, there were 200,000 visitors by plane, 900,000 by car, and 500,000 arrived by cruise ships, totaling over 1.5 million tourists. The Florida Keys have changed because of this increase in population. Ironically, the wildlife that many of these new residents and visitors come to see is being displaced and many species are threatened or endangered. The cost of living is soaring, roads are congested and wastewater treatment problems remain unresolved. Meanwhile, the islands are not getting any bigger. Is there a limit to how many people this fragile ecosystem can sustain? In 1996, the governor of Florida called for the preparation of a carrying capacity analysis of the Florida Keys to be conducted through a cooperative effort by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the Florida Department of Community Affairs, and Monroe County. The Florida Keys Carrying Capacity Study was established marking an effort never before attempted in this country to establish a scientific model to analyze the impacts land development has upon the surrounding ecosystem. Before the study began, we grouped together with the Department of Community Affairs and we worked with a group of stakeholders down in the Florida Keys. Uh, it included federal agencies, uh, state agencies, and then many private citizen groups and organizations. And we all together developed the scope of work for the carrying capacity study. This is a uh, complex, study that incorporates uh, elements of the natural uh, environment and the socioeconomic environment. Our team is formed by experts in different disciplines and we all work together to come uh, bring together answers to the key question of what is the carrying capacity of the Florida Keys. In doing so, we look at the effect of potential development scenarios on the terrestrial and marine ecosystems, the socioeconomic uh, situation of the Florida Keys, and the infrastructure of the Florida Keys. We put the scope of work together and we realized we still have some unanswered questions. How are we going to come up with the carrying capacity for the Florida Keys? Because of those unanswered questions, we decided we'll put a group of experts together. So in the categories that we needed, we, we convened a group of about 65 experts and those folks at the beginning of the study, early on, we held technical workshops and they attended and they asked, answered several questions or gave us a method that we could follow that we could answer these questions through the study. The primary result of the study will be a determination of the ability of the Florida Keys ecosystem to withstand all impacts of additional land development activities. The study will result and a carrying capacity analysis model to analyze a range of potential growth scenarios. The study will not result in a single number, but will identify a range of development options. The model begins with changes in land use. Once the new land use has been chosen, the effect this change has on the environment can be calculated. This includes effects upon the wildlife habitat, plant and animal populations, levels of stormwater and wastewater contaminants, and changes in demand for services and employment. The model can also help agencies plan for changes in the demand for government services and infrastructure, such as the supply of fresh water and emergency hurricane evacuations. How much development is too much? Are we endangering our endangered species? Are we eradicating species? Are we developing to a point where it costs too much money for the average person to live in this area? 
Th those are important questions that this study will answer. Key's residents differ in their opinions as to whether the carrying capacity of the islands has already been exceeded. However, the team creating the model has no attachment to any particular outcome. We have not entered into the carrying capacity study with any preconceived notions. A hearing officer in, I think it was 1992, for the state of Florida uh, concluded that there were several parameters or, or criteria that had their carrying capacity had been exceeded in the Florida Keys. And those included hurricane evacuation, nearshore water quality, the key deer, and seagrass beds. Um, we didn't want to just go on that conclusion. We developed the science or we gathered all of the existing science that was available today, the best available science, and we want the science to tell us where we're at with the carrying capacity in the Florida Keys. Science will build the model, which will be used regionally to develop sufficient guidelines for land development regulations, rate of growth ordinances, and ecosystem restoration needs. The model is not focused on specific studies or individual issues and jurisdictions. People um, are concerned about what the results are going to be from the carrying capacity study. and. Um, Again, I'm not sure people believe this when I say this, but I honestly don't know what the results will be. We're getting a feel for that right now. Um, but the more you learn about um, carrying capacity, the more you realize you don't know. And this is not just a biological carrying capacity or a planner's carrying capacity or a social scientist. This is everyone's idea of what the word carrying capacity means. The model will not answer questions until variables in the equation are changed. Therefore, the team building the model is not dictating the way development will occur in the future. That decision will be made by land managers and community leaders elected by the people. Local planners will be able to foresee the effects their decisions will have on all facets of the Keys environment. The model will give them a way of seeing into the future and forecasting the impacts of their choices. I like to say that the technical contractor is doing the fun part of this process because we, are, we, we have the luxury to work on the scientific aspects of this. Once the study is completed, the users, the local governments, will have to make hard decisions based on the information that we're producing. The team is relying on hard facts and systematic data to build the model. For some categories, such as quality of life, there is only opinion and consensus. Thus, the team has been meeting with community and grassroots organizations to determine what is important to the people who live here. The Florida Keys is unique uh, for these type of studies, mainly because it is a well-defined, uh, self-contained system. You have a series of islands connected by one road in the middle of a large uh, marine system and issues of carrying capacity are easier to define. We look at the ability of the terrestrial ecosystems to sustain an, a growing human population. We, have, uh, we look at the ability of the nearshore marine waters uh, to sustain increased loads of nutrients and pollutants. We look at the effect that these nutrients and pollutants may have on the seagrass and coral reef communities. And we also look at the effect of uh, the socioeconomic uh, context of the Florida Keys, all in a self-contained environment, which makes it easier than if we were to do a study like this in an open area. Unlike open areas, where sprawl is possible, the Florida Keys may illustrate a global issue. The Keys may be an indicator for world trends. These trends may be occurring elsewhere, but are harder to recognize. The creation of this model for the Florida Keys carrying capacity could be a blueprint from which the nation, and potentially the world, could benefit.
common name, Roseate Spoonbill. Family, Thruskiornithidae. Genus, Ajaya. Species, Ajaja. Diet, small fish, crustaceans. Height, 31 inches. Wingspan, 51 inches. Color, carmine and rose pink adults, light pink and white juveniles. Distribution, Florida and the south coast of Texas and Louisiana and parts of Central and South America. The roseate spoonbill is the only spoonbill native to the Western Hemisphere. With brightly colored pink and red feathers, the spoonbill is named for its long beak that flattens at the end, like a spoon. Every October, roseate spoonbills flock to the red and black mangroves of Florida Bay and the Everglades. The isolated islands surrounded by deep water channels protect the nest from raccoons, while the inner island creeks with pooled water provide an abundant food source. Spoonbills uh, historically nested in Florida Bay and to the best of our knowledge have been here for hundreds of years. Uh, there are records from the 1800s that indicate there were several thousand spoonbills nesting in Florida Bay. Um, however, at the turn of the century, uh, wading bird feathers were worth their weight in gold, literally, and they were hunted. And spoonbills were no exception to that. They were hunted basically to extinction in Florida. Uh, in 1935, uh, five new nests were discovered here in Florida Bay, and from that point, all the roseate spoonbills that we see in Florida came back from those five nests. Between 1935 and 1978, Spoonbill populations increased exponentially from five nests to almost 1,200. The initial surge in spoonbills was due to laws prohibiting the trading of their feathers. And although some were still killed for meat, this butchery came to an end in 1948 with the establishment of the Everglades National Park. This golden age soon ended. Between 1978 and 1984, just six years, the spoonbill populations were cut in half in Florida Bay. Today, in 2002, these numbers have remained at about 500 to 600 nests. We believe what happened, uh, and our data strongly suggests this, is that Water management practices um, in, in the early 1980s really changed. Uh, there were some pumps that came online, there were some activities, uh, operational activities that took place, and water levels uh, in the upper parts of Taylor Slough, which delivers water to Florida Bay, were severely altered. And from 1982 to present, we see this decline in the number of spoonbills that are nesting in northeastern Florida Bay. Spoonbill's habitat consists of shallow marine brackish or freshwater sites. Their diet consists mostly of small fish like sheep's head, minnows, mosquito fish, marsh killifish, and some small crustaceans like prawns. Spoonbills feed by a method called tactile location. This means that they feel for their food. One of the things that they will do is they will go and look for other Area, other places where other wading birds are feeding. If other birds are there, then um, that's obviously a pretty good place to forage. Now when a spoonbill comes to a feeding location, what they do is they'll, they'll immediately settle down, fly right in, and they'll kind of look around. And the, what they're, I don't know what they're cueing on, but there's definitely some kind of visual cue that goes on where if they don't see the right uh, habitat or the right water depth or even the fish themselves they'll leave but if they do see that the the area they are at is good for foraging they'll begin to forage and what they do is they they dip their bill into the water and they move it back and forth in kind of a scythe like motion and if you look at the bill of a spoonbill the tip of it is just filled with nerve endings it's much more sensitive than say your fingertips and when they encounter a prey item uh, which is mostly fish, about 80, 85 to 90 percent of their diet is fish, the, the uh, bill snaps shut very, very quickly and traps the fish inside and then they lift their head out of the water and swallow the food. Um, now that happens while they're still kind of walking forward. So there's this process where they, they're walking forward and their head swinging back and forth. They look kind of drunk when they're doing it. Um, 
but it's very successful for them. They catch a lot of little fish that many of the other animals out there don't exploit. And so they're taking advantage of a resource that is readily available. Although food is plentiful for spoonbills, access to the food is problematic. The maximum foraging depth for spoonbills is about 8 inches. Until recently, the upper keys were surrounded by mangrove marshes, ideal for wading bird habitat. However, humans destroyed these ecosystems when they built their deep water canal systems so that everyone could have a waterfront home. Between 1960 and the early 70s, approximately 60 to 80 percent of the spoonbill foraging habitat was destroyed because of dredge and fill operations. And although laws were put in place in 1972 to end the destruction, most of the damage was done. And while spoonbill's habitat shrunk, water management practices began. By the year 2000, there were six million people on the east coast of South Florida. Most of these people settled in areas that were formerly Everglades wetlands. In order to keep these houses from flooding, the Everglades were drained, canals and dams were built, and the distribution of water into Florida Bay was drastically changed. The dry season became more wet. The wet season became more dry. And the people were happy. However, spoonbills depended upon certain water levels at certain times of the year. The shallow flats that were once accessible to spoonbills became too deep to forage. Spoonbills move around the state in an attempt to find the best foraging habitat, and that switches. Uh, Florida Bay has the lowest water level in, in basically January through March. Tampa Bay's low water levels are uh, April through June or July and then low water levels, uh, water levels in, in mesquite impoundments in the Indian River Lagoon are kept artificially low during the wet season, say from August to October or November. And so they run that cycle from Florida Bay to Tampa Bay to Indian River Lagoon and then back to Florida Bay. Spoonbill mating is initiated in October when they begin building their nests. Typically, a spoonbill will lay between two and five eggs per nest. It takes about 21 days of incubation time uh, for the spoonbills to hatch. During that period, one of the parents has to stay with the eggs uh, to help them thermoregulate. They would either get too cold or too hot and, and kill the embryos inside. So one spoonbill stays with the nest at all time. Um, after 21 days, the young chicks start to hatch and, and uh, the first laid egg hatches first, but uh, the other two hatch much quicker. So where there's a three-day gap between the laying of eggs, they all hatch at pretty much uh, the same time. Um, at that point, the energetic demands of the young become pretty severe. Uh, these eggs, the chicks that hatch out of these eggs, are about the size of a chicken egg, and so the, the young are very tiny. But within 21 days, they'll grow to almost, if not beyond, half the size of the adult. So for three young to grow that fast in 21 days requires a great deal of energy. At 21 days, the chicks are big enough to venture out of the nest. Although unable to fly, the hatchlings will hop from branch to branch, displaying very little coordination. If people disturb the nests at this time, the chicks can easily fall into the water and freeze to death. So at 21 days they start moving around, um, they no longer need the parents to help them thermoregulate. Uh, they can do that pretty much on their own. So now both parents can be gone from the nest at the same time. Usually one of them stays uh, around to protect the young, but they both can go looking for food if need be. And again, they're bringing back a, a constant supply of food because in the next 21 day period, um, the three chicks will grow to about 75% of the size of the adult and they'll begin to learn how to fly. And so again, you have very high energetic demands of the young, and it helps to be able to send both parents out to get that food. After a month of leaving the nest, the parental bond breaks down, and at that point, the young bird is on its own. If it cannot successfully forage at this point, it will die. Roseate spoonbills were listed in 1979 as a species of special concern by the state of Florida. While water management issues have been a significant detractor from spoonbill populations, human curiosity and an increase in tourism has also hurt numbers. 
over the last couple of years, uh, eco tours in Florida Bay have become very, very popular. And without trying to dissuade people from going out and enjoying our environment, uh, eco tour operators, I think, have to practice a little more uh, restraint in what they do. Uh, for example, a couple years back um, on Buchanan Key in the lower, in, in the uh, kind of in the southern part of the bay. Um, there were wading birds nesting there, including spoonbills, and there's a creek that goes in there that, that you really can't get in very well uh, in a boat. Oh, well, uh, some unscrupulous individual literally cut down the mangrove inside this, this key, which is an Everglades National Park, so that he could get his, his, his boat in there and run commercial tours in there and show people nesting uh, birds. Well, that colony is now gone. Uh, no wading birds nest there, no spoonbills nest there anyway. Um, and I believe that, that that was a result of this disruption. Recently, eco-tour operators have led groups kayaking into mangrove habitat in Florida Bay where spoonbills are nesting. Each time a group approaches a nest, the adult spoonbills flee. With repeated disturbances, the parents could abandon their nest, leaving their babies to a slow death. And so I think that, that a lot of the decline in spoonbills that we've seen, at least in the northeastern part of the bay near the Keys, is not just water management, but the fact that they're also, it's a kind of a, a double whammy, they're also being um, uh, uh, chased around, uh, taunted by human beings. Uh, and all they're doing is looking for a nice place to be able to sit with their eggs, with their young, and not be disturbed. And so there is a cautionary tale here that if you're chasing spoonbills off an island, you are doing severe damage. While eco-tour operators claim to be educating the public, their efforts can be counterproductive. Likewise, although initial water management practices may have been considered desirable, researchers have proof that these practices must be changed. Now the downturn we've seen in spoonbills since the 1980s is reversible. Um, if we fix the system, the spoonbills will come back, and that's the whole purpose of the Central Everglades Restoration Plan. Uh, if we restore quantity, timing, and distribution of flow to Florida Bay, which is part of that plan, we will restore uh, the spoonbill colonies in northeastern Florida Bay. They will come back. Um, I feel pretty strongly about that. But in addition to that, we, we won't know whether those things are actually having a good impact on Florida Bay or a bad impact on Florida Bay unless we're out there watching these things. Somebody has to monitor the health of the bay, and we think by looking at spoonbills and other wading birds and other species, we can tell water managers whether what they're doing is good or bad, and in that way have a very positive impact on, on the future of Florida Bay.